welcome to sportsbet.io as we are looking forward to match day three of the Premier League and we're going to start with the big one uh, which is 4pm on Sunday just be aware that everything starts 30 minutes earlier than a normal Sunday 4pm on Sunday it is Manchester United against Liverpool Man United a 3.6 Liverpool a 1.9 under 2 to win at Old Trafford uh, 4.2 for the tie. First pickings on this one, of course, we've got to go to the guy who's got very close connections to the Reds. That's Neil Melly. Your thoughts on this one, bud? Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. I think Liverpool are favourites, and rightly so, because Liverpool are ahead of Manchester United at the moment. Um, owe them one for last season in the league. Owe them one for the FA Cup. Owe them one at Anfield as well. Liverpool didn't beat Man United last season and were miles better than them. We had 30 shots at Anfield, didn't score. Battered them in the FA Cup and somehow they squeezed through it in extra time. Couldn't beat Liverpool in 90 minutes. And then the league game as well, the 2-2. I was at, at Old Trafford and the United fans were celebrating. Celebrating a draw against Liverpool. That's where United are at. Liverpool were really disappointed. I think going into the game, United haven't had a bad result at Brighton. They tried to bring Ugarte in. Whether they can get that over the line in time, well, they will do. But will he be involved? I don't know. Sterling as well. <laughs> All's not well at United and Liverpool. Everything is is okay at the moment. So strong favourites. I think Liverpool will do what they should have done last year and get the, get the result. I think Ugarte, for me personally, is a very very clever signing. Scott McTominay is leaving. Uh, they're bringing Ugarte in. So I think, look at it in kind of net spend. It's about, you know, 50 million more that Man United are spending on this because they're, they're recouping a lot from Scott McTominay. Uh, this is a guy who registered 41 ball recoveries uh, in League 1 for the uh, first four games for PSG, which is the most in the league. So he's a combative midfielder. So if he does indeed play, maybe a yellow card in this thrown in at the deep end derby could be something worth looking at. What's your thinking on this one, Paul? Then Man United at home to Liverpool. I can't believe you just glossed over the fact that Neil Miller sat there telling us how much Liverpool were better than Manchester United and how good they were and what a better place they're in. And then goes on to say, but they didn't beat them last year. Are we just ignoring that, are we? <laughs> no, I'm leaving I'm leaving it all open to you. Producer Will, by the way, is a Man United fan. He is loving every bit of this. I'm getting all hand all kinds of hand gesticulations from behind the uh, behind the glass. No, the floor is yours, my friend. Pick him up on it. No, listen, I, I agree with him that they're in a better place and they're a better team. I was at Anfield last week. I saw them play against Brentford and under Arnie Slot, they're they're a different side. He spoke about enjoying possession. And you could see that the way that they played. They have got this rock and roll, um, heavy metal football, like the, you talk about in Jurgen Klopp. And actually, Liverpool look the most dangerous on the turnover of possession. One, two passes, they're at the edge of Brentford's box creating chances. But there wasn't a, an immediate rush to win a the game. There wasn't an immediate rush to score four or five goals. You could see them actually, Diaz, Salah, turning out, rejuvenating the ball, recycling the ball through the midfield. And they did look a different team in possession. They've had two comfortable 2-0 wins, haven't they, to the start of the season? And to be fair, they look good for it. They could have had more against Brentford. The only time their goal looked threatened was on set plays. Norgard had a really clear chance for Brentford uh, from a header. But defensively, they looked OK. They looked good. In possession, they looked really good, really strong. And listen, I, I like Neil. I know I was joking, but I've got them favourites going to Old Trafford because United aren't quite there yet, are they? Should they be under two? Should they be less than double your money? Would you say the pricing is about right for Liverpool on this one at 1.9? Neil, would you say that's about fair? Yeah, I was expecting something similar. I think I'm fully expecting Liverpool to to be favourites for this game because United are showing signs of, of what they were last season. You know, to go down to Brighton and, and get beaten, no real surprise. You know, I look, I look at the Premier League and I think Liverpool, Arsenal and Man City are, are just that little bit further ahead than everybody else and... and the rest, United included, Tottenham, will be chasing for that fourth place. So um, it's been a slow start. I mean, they weren't that convincing against Fulham anyway at home, Manchester United. They're still trying to do business in terms of players coming through. Maguire played, uh, the Cas Casemiro played as well against Brighton. So um, I think Liverpool might be hoping for something similar in terms of the team lineup. I can't believe Garnacho is on the bench. Uh, I mean, I, I look at Garnacho and I see him as one of United's biggest threats. United will play counter-attacking football at home. Uh, and, and obviously, the fans may not like that. Well, that will be the biggest threat they have against Liverpool. Liverpool contained Brentford's counter-attack really, really well. So, um, hopefully, we'll have to do the same again at Old Trafford. But, yeah, Liverpool to score. Liverpool to score and to win this game. 
uh, there has been plenty of goals uh, between these two sides. In the last nine head-to-head meetings between Manchester United and Liverpool, seven in the Premier League, two in the FA Cup, over 3.5 goals has landed in seven of those nine, with the other two being a 2-1 and a 0-0. And Liverpool have not won in their last three games at Old Trafford. Premier League last time out, 2-2 tie. 4-3 defeat after extra time in the FA Cup and a 2-1 defeat back in 2022, of course. I don't need to remind Neil Manor the last time Liverpool won at Old Trafford and what the scoreline was, but I will do anyway. I'll ask the question, what was that game? Well, it's the same referee. So the ref, this referee, Anthony Taylor, has refereed this fixture three times at Old Trafford. Manchester United 2, Liverpool 2 last season. The season, the time before, Manchester United 0, Liverpool 5. And the time before, Manchester United 2, Liverpool 4. So three games, Liverpool have a good record with Anthony Taylor. And a lot's <laughs> made about where his location from Altrincham and all that, Manchester United territory. But three games, United can't beat us with Taylor. So hopefully that will continue. Uh, so let's go for score prediction time in this one Man United against Liverpool I have to start with you Neil Man United Liverpool I think the fans play a big part in this fixture they really do they create a, a difficult atmosphere Arna Slot's first experience of this game that's United's biggest strength the fans and, and they'll make it intimidating for Liverpool try and make it difficult but I think Liverpool's quality will come through. Jota's fit. I think Jota... Liverpool missed too many chances against them last year. I think they'll, they'll take the chances this time. So I've got a comfortable away win. 3-1. Oh, 3-1. Comfortable Liverpool away victory at Old Trafford. Uh, what about you, Paul? Man United against Liverpool. Score prediction, please. Listen, I watched United last week and I thought they were poor at Brighton. Um, but I did tip them to get beat up, to get beat there, didn't I? Um I think the, the fans do play a big part in it. I think there's there's more to it. It's one of them, the, the old adage, form goes out the window. 2-2. Two, 2-2, two. Two, two, same as last time. Two, two. I'll tell you something now. I'll, I'll look at the price for 2-2 two, because two, I something about this just tells me that Man United at 3.6. There's a lot of people who'd be tempted by that price. I haven't gone through the signings as well. Liverpool have agreed to sign Giorgio Mamadashvili. We spoke of that a couple of weeks ago, but he's staying at Valencia. He's going to join up with the Reds at the start of next season. They've also signed Federico Chiesa. Uh, he's uh, set to sign for a relatively small fee from Juventus. What's your thinking on that signing, uh, Neil? Bargain. Absolute bargain, an experienced international. Over 50 caps for, for Italy. I don't see it as a big risk because of the fee, you know, just over £10 million. People are making a lot about the injury he sustained, which was a couple of years ago. He played 33 games in the league last season uh, for Juventus, so he still had a lot of football. I don't see him as a starter. I, I see him as certainly a squad player who will get game time to cover Salah on the right-hand side and maybe play the odd time on the left-hand side. So a really good addition to the squad because there's going to be a lot of games this season for Liverpool. Champions League's being extended as well. So an experienced international with quality, with pace to come into that uh, attack for Liverpool. I think that's a good uh, good bit of business then. And you've also now seen a couple of games under Arne Slot as well. So your kind of 30-second review of what you've seen from this Liverpool under new management. What, what What's your thinking uh, with Liverpool? You've got to be pleased with the, the performance and the results, of course. Played two games, expected to win both games and have won both games convincingly. There'll be bigger tests to come. The new style is a slightly more patient for retention, over 90% uh, pass completion in, in the previous game, which was a high for Liverpool in the Premier League, but still create loads of chances. So uh, bigger tests to come starting this weekend against Manchester United, but so far so good. And Manchester United had a rumour to be looking at exploratory talks over a deal to sign Raheem Sterling from Chelsea. Those are the rumours. Of course, it is the final week of the transfer window as well. So who knows what's going to happen in the next few days. 2-2, by the way. First big price of the preview. 11.4 for 2-2, which happened last time out at Old Trafford. So that's Man United against Liverpool. Just to remind you, it is a 4pm kickoff on Sunday. Not your normal uh, 4.30pm. It starts 30 minutes earlier. Uh, then we'll move to your first game on Saturday, which is 12.30, which is Arsenal against Brighton. Arsenal are short at 1.36. Brighton are 7.4. We'll go into this, but Brighton actually have very good encouragement of going to Arsenal because it's a place they've won a number of games at. 57 
for the tie. Arsenal have beaten Wolves 2 0 and Aston Villa 2 0. So they had to concede a goal. Brighton beat Everton 3 0 and Man United 2 1. So both these sides going into this with a 100% success rate. Paul, you're thinking first game on Saturday, Arsenal against Brighton. What's your thoughts? Well, you said it there, the preview, the 2 0, the Arsenal not to, not to concede a goal. And I think that's where they look really strong this year. Um, Timber played, he came on the last game. But listen, they, it wasn't a 2 0 at Aston Villa, was it? Aston Villa were excellent. I thought David Rea played really, really well in the Arsenal goal, kept him in that game and kept him, kept the clean sheet. Defensively at home, they're always going to be solid, they're always going to be tough to beat. I like the way that Partey's playing in that midfield, allowing Declan Rice and Odegaard to, to deploy themselves higher up the pitch. And I think Arsenal at home this season, they're going to be very, very difficult to back against. Like you said, the odds there, they're going to be low. They're going to be short. Arsenal at home, if you back an Arsenal at home, you're going to have to go a goal scorer. You're going to have to pick you know, corners, cards, etc. Odegaard booked last week. Declan Rice booked last week. Gabriel booked last week. So there is cards in the Arsenal team. Brighton are a good team. And as you say, they've got a decent record um, at, at the Emirates. New manager, not a lot's changed really, has it? I like the way that they play. I like the way that they attack Man United. Um, it's going to be a good game. I don't think it's going to be a wide open game. It'll be a good close game, a tactically well thought out game. But I've got Arsenal just to nudge this one simply defensively. I'm not, not sure Brighton have got the players that can score the goals to hurt Arsenal. Uh, transfer news for Arsenal. Uh, Mikel Marino has joined Arsenal, 28-year-old from Real Sociedad. But leaving is Eddie Nketiah. Looks set for Crystal Palace for £25 million. That seems a fairly good price for Eddie Nketiah. And also your thoughts on this one, Paul, with Aaron Ramsdale set to join Southampton for a fee of £18 million. What's your thought on Ramsdale leaving Arsenal? Because, of course, he went there for a big price. He became their number one, then wasn't their number one. Uh, and he finds himself in what could be another relegation battle season at Southampton. He's leaving for 18 million. What's your thoughts on that? Yes, we've gone on before about Aaron Ramsdale. You know, I think he's a top quality goalkeeper and he'd been harshly treated. Um, but that's what happens sometimes when managers make decisions. You look at his attitude and you look at the way that he's always got a smile on his face. He's never spoken in the press, never whinged, never said, I want to leave, never said, I want out, never said, this isn't right. His work on the training field and whenever he's been called upon, he's played well. I think he's a top-class goalkeeper and I think it's a really, really shrewd bit of business from Southampton. I really do. Because if he's going to Chelsea, if he's going to Man U, if he's going to Man City, they're paying 40, 45 million for him. Southampton have picked up an absolute bargain there. Listen, he'll have a clause in his contract. If they go down, there'll be a relegation clause in there. Southampton have backed themselves. Listen, so let's let's. I think there's, there's add-ons in the deal, isn't there? So it's yeah. 18 potentially going up to 25. So basically, they're going to loan him. If, if they go down... They're paying a loan fee for him for a year if he is then to move on. I think it's a really clever bit of business from Southampton because if they're buying him at 18 million, maximum 25, they stay up in the Premier League in another two or three years, they're potentially going to be able to sell him for that and a bit more. If not, if they go down, the relegation clause is basically like a loan fee for the year. It's only because you look at the top teams, top six, eight teams in the Premier League, they're all stacked with goalkeepers. Nobody needs and he doesn't want to go into another club and be in exactly the same position as, as he's in at Arsenal. Because you may as well stay at Arsenal, who are second in the league, Champions League, etc. And you're going to play more games. You've got to give the kid a lot of credit for what he wants to do, for where he wants to play football, regardless of where it is in the Premier League. And I think it's a really clever move by Southampton. And I think it'll work for him. Yeah, it's 26. He's on the cusp of the England team. Uh, new manager as well, Lee Carsley. Uh, England are playing, uh, you know, in, in the next week or so. There's an international break coming and. The one thing he wants is um, his first team football week in, week out. Brighton have also spent money. Matt O'Reilly from Celtic for 25 million. They've also uh, signed Ferdi Kalioglu, uh, the fullback from Turkey, Fenerbahce, for 25 million as well. Now, Neil, are they, Brighton, just a little bit too big at 7.4? They've got a good record. I know Arsenal did the double over Brighton last season, beat them 2 0 at home, 3 0 away from home. Highest scoring half was the second half in both games, so it was fairly tight for the first 45 minutes. Previous to last season, Brighton have come to Arsenal and won four of the last five games. They've got a good record at Arsenal. I know it's a slightly different Arsenal now that, you know, the, the Arteta's got the squad that he wants and they're, they're motoring forward. But are Brighton a little bit too big for you at 7.4? No, no. No, I'm all over Arsenal for this one. Uh, I think Arsenal have started the season professionally. I don't think they've really clicked into gear yet. But a couple of 2-0 wins. Got away with it, maybe you could say at Villa. You know, that first goal was vital. A couple of big misses from Watkins. Had that have gone in, it might have been a different outcome. But it looks a decent result away at Villa, that one. But yeah, comfortable win in terms of Arsenal. Brighton have scored more goals 
um, than, than Arsenal so far this season. They've scored five in the two Premier League games. They played in the Cup, Brighton, against Crawley. They made 11 changes. And you mentioned about O'Reilly, who's an outstanding signing from Celtic. I think he's a brilliant player. He got injured. And he the did. worry for Brighton is, how long will he be out for? He'll obviously miss this game, which is a big blow for Brighton. They have a goal threat, Brighton. I think you say that. But I just don't think they'll contain Arsenal. I think Arsenal will sort of grow a little bit. But this is the last game before the first of three international breaks before Christmas. Yeah, I'm out on Arsenal to win this one. Big price, I know, for Brighton. Good start from Brighton. I think Arsenal will be too good. There, there must be nothing more soul-destroying for a manager than making a big key signing and then get injured in the first game and could be out. I know it happened at Man United as well. It must be absolute soul-destroying. Uh, Arsenal are 1.36, Brighton are 7.4, 5.74 for the tie. Let's go for the uh, score predictions on this one. And Neil, you went first last time, so Paul, I'm coming to you. Arsenal against Brighton, 12.30 on Saturday. Professional. Good work, Mel's. Good work for the way to start the season. Professional routine. Well, that, 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 that Arsenal victory, just go back to the Arsenal victory at Aston Villa. That, they didn't play too well. Uh, Ollie Watkins had an absolute nightmare. He missed the sitter in the first half. Goalkeepers pulling out uh, uh, amazing saves and keeping them at bay. And then Arsenal score two goals and win the game. That's such an important result for Arsenal to go to a place where they struggled last year. And it's already three more points on the board than what they had last season because they lost at Villa. That's, that's a, such a significant result for them so early on, isn't it, for Arsenal? really is. Professional performance. There it doesn't go. always necessarily have to be good. You have to walk away with the three points. And I think exactly. You, you learn to- Learn to win ugly, isn't it? That's one of the sayings. That's what it is. Learn to win ugly. No pitches on the league table. 2 0 again for Arsenal. 2 0 again. Job done scoreline. 3 2 0 to start the season, therefore, for Arsenal. That is Paul's prediction. Neil, your thoughts on Arsenal against Brighton? Yeah, I'd be on Havertz to score as well. He's got four in his last four at the Emirates, so uh, he could be a bet for a, a, an Arsenal goal scorer. I think Arsenal will win, but just the way Brighton have started the season with goals, I would give them a goal. As good as I think Arsenal are defensively. So I've got a 3 1. Home win for Arsenal. Uh, yes, three uh, one for. Uh, let me look at the price on that for Arsenal. Arsenal, by the way, have only conceded one goal at home in their previous three home games, so they are tightening up at the back. You've gone for three one for. Uh, that's a full ten. Three one for. Um, for Arsenal is a 10, so double figures. Uh, those are the thoughts of the guys regarding Arsenal against Brighton, which is your first game for match day three. Uh, kicks off 12.30 on Saturday. Your last game on Saturday, therefore, is West Ham against Manchester City. West Ham have yet to leave London. They've done nothing but play games in London so far this season. West Ham are 6.6, another fairly big prize for their home side. They've not beat Man City for almost a decade now in the Premier League 2014 was the last time they registered a win in the Premier League against Man City 1.4 for Man City 5.5 for the tie I'll come to you Neil for your thoughts on all things West Ham against Man City um, It's hard to predict to go against City isn't it you know, you know they started the season they went 1-0 behind against Ipswich and everyone knew they'd come back ended up winning the game 4-1 Harland hat-trick they got a decent win away at Chelsea first game as well West Ham played in the League Cup um, against Bournemouth. No VAR. VAR would have disallowed the only goal, which was Jared Bowen's handball. Um, so, yeah, they, they got through there and they played quite a strong lineup, uh, West Ham. So, I wonder how sort of jaded they might be for this one. This is a big game for them. You mentioned about them having a poor record against Man City. The last time they beat them at home was 2014. The last time it was nil nil. Here we go. Question for you both. And Paul will like this one because it's goalkeeper related. So, last time it was nil nil was 2012. I want to know who the two goalkeepers were. West Ham, Man City. Last time it was nil-nil. I don't think it would be nil-nil. That's why I'm asking this question. It was nil-nil, 2012. Who were the goalkeepers? West Ham, Man City. Come on. 2012. One was English. Rob Joe Green. Hart. Joe Hart. He was the only English player that day. There for, we are. Um, I can relax now. I got one right. I can just relax. Oh, <laughs> the, West Ham goal, the West Ham goal is difficult because when you think of this goalie, you don't really think of him playing for, for West Ham. You sort of put him at a different Premier League club, but who were nowhere near the Premier League club, uh, Premier League at the moment. They were in the Premier League for a number of years and now they're sort of in League One, way off it. That's the worst clue ever that's thrown me. Oh, UC Askelina. Correct. Nailed it. Mm. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Let's just explore how Paul went. 
Paul went, hang on a minute, I'm thrown way off with it. There's the answer. What? That was a plot twist that nobody saw coming. That was an that that is that is a great shout. Somewhere at the back of this big head, it just there was a filing cabinet that it just opened and it came out of. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, that is superb. I I I would give you actual special bonus kudos point for that one. That was that was really good. Um, do you think? Hey, I've got a stat for you. Then, do you think Neil that West Ham can possibly score in this one? Yeah, yeah, I do I do I, I do? Well, and the reason I think West Ham will have a go. Certainly, we'll have a spell at some point. I think they've got some attacking players who will who will create a lot of problems in the Premier League this season. I think the home fans as well. I think they really will make a difference for them. Try and make it difficult for City. I just think City will be too good. Uh, and that will be the yeah. problem for a lot of Premier League teams this season. It's a potential tricky game. I don't think City go there and win 4-5. I think they do just enough. They get the three points. They call. That was a tough game. Tough atmosphere. We're happy to get the three points. Here's a goal scorer for you. And this will surprise you. Man City, you look at Man City, who's going to score for Man City? Bernardo Silva hasn't scored in the Premier League since January. Now, now I look at Bernardo Silva and I think he's one of their best players. He hasn't scored in the Prem since January. I cannot believe that that lad is due a goal for Bernardo Silva to score, City to win. Uh, Phil Foden, by the way, uh, his last goals for Man City were against West Ham. He's not scored in 10, both for West Ham, uh, for, for West Ham, for Man City and England, of course. And he's come back and he's sometimes playing, sometimes not. I know he was ill last, uh, last week. I know that the reason I ask about whether you, you're back in West Ham to score, uh, Man City have not conceded in their last five away games. Clean sheets at Brighton, Forest, Fulham, Spurs and this season, Chelsea. The last three games in, in which West Ham have scored against Manchester City, West Ham scored the first goal in the game in all of those. Uh, they've lost two and they've drawn one. So if you do are backing uh, West Ham to score, maybe to score first could be the way forward. It was against Ipswich last weekend. Um, so uh, let's get to poor thoughts on this one. West Ham against Manchester City. 1.4 for Man City. Is this just a routine win for the away side? We're going to have this conversation most weeks, aren't we? When we're talking about Manchester City, we're going to say, look, it's going to be very, very difficult to beat them. They've got a good record at the London Stadium against West Ham. You look at the players they've got, you look at the way that they've started the season this season. It's, yeah, it's difficult to back against them. You're going to, you're putting Man City in an acker and if, if it doesn't come in, uh, you're going to go back in again, aren't you? I mean, well, a Man City Arsenal double, it's not going to give you a lot of value, but that won't be uh, a bad double in London this weekend. City, you've got quality players. Haaland again, you know, the Ipswich game was, it was a formality that nobody, nobody thought once Ipswich went 1-0 up. I can't believe that you know teams celebrate goals that early, especially when you're away at the Etihad. You know what's coming. It's it's always going to be difficult. And for West Ham, this, the new signings are still settling in, aren't they? Good win um, last week, decent win in the cup. But like Mel says, played a strong team. Can't see anything other than a Man City win. I really can't. I'd be on the Man City Arsenal double this weekend. Uh, Savinho has looked sensational as well for Manchester City, isn't he? I mean, they've got. You, you look at the, 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 some of the players that Man City are coming through, and uh, I know they've just re signed Gundogan as well, so bringing an experience. And maybe that's where Pep has gone. We just need a little bit of experience because actually we've got quite a number of young players, you know, with the likes of Oscar Bob who's coming through. I know he's injured at the moment, but you look at Savinho, who's 20, Doc, who's 22. You forget that Holland's only 24. It's been around for many a year. Holland is still 24. So a little bit of experience brought in uh, for, by Pep. Go on then, uh, we've got score lines on this one. Uh, it was Paul who went first last time, so back to Neil for West Ham against Manchester City. West Ham is place of goals, it's generally both teams score. What's your thinking in this one score line, please? Yeah, both teams to score, and City just just to have enough to get the three points. So I've got West Ham one, Man City two. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I it's got to be some kind of a record, really, if Man City do keep a clean sheet. Six consecutive away uh, clean sheets. First side, he'll work quite leaky last season. Uh, what's your thinking in this one then, Paul? Your scoreline, West Ham against Manchester City. Yeah, very similar. But I give City another goal later, later on in the game. 93rd minute, they'll make it 3-1. 3-1 City. Uh, three one Man City is a full ten of it. Double figures on that one. Two one for Man City is eight. Still a relatively good price. We will be going through uh, last week's score predictions soon, where someone has uh, only one correct score prediction, one nailed on from last week. We'll talk about that uh, shortly. Then we'll go to a one thirty kickoff on Sunday. They normally kick off at two on Sunday, but not. It's thirty minutes earlier. 
I don't know why, but just be aware of that. Uh, we're talking Newcastle United against Spurs. This generally has been a game full of goals in the past. Uh, Newcastle, two point... I'll tell you something now. Look at the pricing on this one and split the airs here. Newcastle to win, 2.52. Spurs to win, 2.52. It's an absolute pick'em, uh, which is why we're talking about it. Four for the tie from St. James's Park on Sunday afternoon. Uh, Paul, your thoughts on Newcastle against Spurs? Yeah, listen, you've, you've teed it up really well. I think two teams that will play attacking football, two teams that score goals, and a fixture that historically has got goals in it. Um, look at Spurs last week. Good. Um, I was there at the Leicester game. Excellent first half. Should have been three or four up. Uh, the way that they play. Odebert played last week. Um, looked like he'd been there for seasons. He, he slotted in really well. I think he's given him an option. I think he's a player that they've not had necessarily. I think he's a, he's a winger that goes past people. They've had on the outside. You know, Kulazewski's son come in. They, they do go past players, but they come a lot on the inside. And then with Odebert, he's a player who will run around the outside. He'll give them that pace and the crosses will come into the box. I know Solanke wasn't fit last week. But I think that's what the, the manager's thinking. That more, more balls are going to be going into the box. And that was certainly the case at Leicester. And Solanke had a number of chances. Whether he's fit or not, don't know. Um, Newcastle's point of view, Isaac Gomez, he looks good this year, Gomez, what I've seen of him so far. And Newcastle at home. Listen, this is just going to be a cracking fixture. Like you said, with those odds there, 2.52 for either side. It, it literally is a take your pick. This could be a four-all, a one-all, a four-three. It could be a cracking game, this, because both teams will be going to win this fixture. And Tottenham only play one way. Uh, these teams have absolutely battered each other in the last five head-to-head -head meetings. The last two visits for uh, Spurs at Newcastle, they've lost 4-0 and 6-1. <laughs> so they're 10-1 down on aggregate to their last two visits to St. James's Park. But when Newcastle have travelled south to Spurs, Spurs have walloped them 4-1 and 5-1. <laughs> so these teams have absolutely smashed the living daylights out of each other uh, in recent fixtures. Is this a bit of a goal fest for you therefore, Neil? Can you just see plenty of goals, plenty of drama at St. James's Park? Yeah, I hope so. Uh, although I would say Newcastle haven't got going yet this season. Scrape three against Southampton with the red card 1-0. Uh, second game, I was disappointed. I thought they'd go there and get a result at Bournemouth. Just a 1-1 draw in the end. Got away with it with that VAR course. So, uh, four points so far for uh, for Newcastle. Good win last week for Spurs. I agree there's goals there. Isaac's a player who I really like. I think he's a top finisher. Hasn't scored yet this season. In, um, and I'm surprised by that. So, he finished with nine in his last ten for Newcastle. So, you've got to be fancying Isaac to get on the score sheet at some point. And here is that question. I want a number. I want a number off you both. You mentioned about goals, goals, goals. There has not been a nil-nil in this game in our lifetime. 1971, you have to go back to. Just the last time there was a nil-nil. The number I want from you both, and, and I'd be surprised if anyone got it, so closest to it. How many games has there been between these two teams since it was nil-nil? Uh, you're talking 1971? Yeah, but the last time it was doing nil, so we're 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 talking many many years. Uh, I I would say forty seven. I'll go forty six. <laughs> you cheeky devil! God. No, we're in the eighty eight <laughs> games. Oh. Eighty eight oh. games since it was a nil. So there will not be a nil nil. I know there's due one, but these two Famous. teams. Are too too many goals there. Too many goals. I think there will be goals in this game. Yeah, it could be a goal fest. You mentioned Isak, by the way. Isak, if he wants to get... The, the reason he's not been scoring is because I put him up front in my fantasy Premier League side. Honestly, if a player performs badly, he's in my FPL side. The minute I drop him, he'll perform well. So uh, it's all linked to my FPL side, I, I promise you. Isak, by the way, if there's one side that he's going to get up and running against and score his first goals, it is against Spurs. He's got four goals in the last two home games against Spurs. Uh, Joe Linton has also found... Everybody for Newcastle has pretty much found the net with those 10 goals they've scored in the last two. Uh, so New Newcastle against uh, Spurs in this one. Both teams are fifth and sixth in the very early Premier League table. Both have got uh, four points. Uh, there's only four teams who have started with two wins out of two. So let's get the score predictions in this one. It could be goal heavy at St. James's Park. Well, the last couple of games actually haven't. There's been a 1-0 and a 1-1. Uh, let's get first pickings on this one for Paul. Newcastle against Spurs. 2.52. Both sides are to win. Score prediction, please. I think it will be goal heavy. I've got Tottenham to win, but I like the yellow cards in this one as well. 
you look at the two teams, you look at the back fours, Dan Byrne is always good for a card. Van der Ven, Romero, we know is always good for a card. You look at the wingers and you look at the pace on this pitch with Isaac, Odebert, Johnson maybe, Son, Murphy. There's going to be some fouls in this game. So, listen, I've, I've got Spurs to win it. I think there will be goals. I've got Spurs 3-2. But I think you wait for the team sheets and have a look who's marking who because I think there'll be some good yellow cards in this game. Uh, 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 let me just have a look over over three goals in this one is 1.5 just over three is 1.5 that's that's really short so uh, again sportsbet.io thinking there'll be goals in this one you've gone for 3-1 let me just see if I can find that very quick uh, sorry 3-2 for Spurs yeah 3-2 17 the biggest price that we've put up uh, so far 17 for 3-2 for uh, the away side what's your thinking here Neil your score prediction all things at Newcastle against Spurs Score draw. Yeah, score draw. I'm torn between 1-1, one, 2-2. One, two, two. I, I do think, think both teams will score in the game. I'm going to go a little bit more cautiously and say that we're maybe expecting it to be better than, than it actually will be. So I'm going to go 1-1. One, one. Oh, a bit of a low-key affair. That is nine, by the way. Uh, of course, uh, the last time that Spurs did win at Newcastle was 3-2, where we literally had everything. It was uh, Newcastle took the lead after two and lost the first half 3-1. There was a red card in that one with John Joe Shelby in an own goal. Uh, we've had some absolute belters between these two sides, Newcastle against Spurs. Two teams, you would say, are very much in the same position. Uh, uh, you know, uh, two teams who could be fighting out for the best of the rest beyond the top three. Uh, 2.52 Newcastle, 2.52 for Spurs. Tie four. Uh, whatever your bets are, please do gamble responsibly. We're now going to look at the rest of the games uh, and pull up our score predictions. Uh, before we do that, shall we go through last week's score predictions? The first thing I've got to do is say, well done on your trebles. Your trebles both landed. Uh, Chelsea, full hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm having risky trebles. He's having bankers. Well, I have... <laughs> Yeah, I I have to I have to give you credit for Chelsea. Chelsea was a, a pretty good shout. Uh, I didn't. No one saw the six two coming for Chelsea. We'll talk about those shortly. Uh, Liverpool, Chelsea, Fulham landed for uh, Neil. Uh, relatively safe for Paul, but hey, it's a treble that landed. Uh, Man City, Spurs, and Liverpool all got the job done. Week one was very much in favour of Paul Robinson. He claimed week one more points than Neil. 10-5 it was. And this week, only one correct scoreline, uh, which was uh, Paul's uh, tipping Brighton to win by two goals to one. And you must be kicking yourself, Paul, because you initially were going, I think 2-0 Arsenal, 2-0 Arsenal, 2-0 Arsenal. But you know what? I think Villa will score 2-1. Yep. Just that one goal. But never mind. I think I still might have done okay. Uh, you won uh, week two, so it's 2-0 to you. Uh, and I've got to give special credit to uh, to Neil Meller because he did go for Liverpool to win 3-0 against Brentford. It was 2-0, of course, but he did say Diaz and Salah to score. And, of course, they did. So, uh, uh, By the congratulations. Way, yes. Pedro cost me. If Jao Pedro didn't score in the 95th minute, I'd have got the correct score and I'd have beat Paul. That's how close it was. Small margins. Small. Terrible defensively. Oh. United <laughs> uh, it is indeed. Uh, the the scoreline uh, is. What, what, yeah, what's that saying? If me anti, well, I, I yeah, I, if, if yep, yeah, exactly. I'm with you on that one. Uh, I uh, I can confirm that it's two nil now uh, in weeks uh, for uh, for Paul. So no matter what happens, you're leading for the next couple of weeks because we've got international break after this one before we're back from match day four. Right, let's start with the best of the rest. All the other games, Brentford against Southampton is where we are starting. Brentford are 1.74. Southampton are 4.5 with a new goalkeeper, Aaron Ramsdale. Uh, Brentford have signed Gustano, Gustavo Nunes from Gremio, 18 years old. If you've seen this kid play, he's a little bit of a wonder kid. He's known as a forward, but he's more like a left winger. And the first thing he does, he's like Forrest Gump. He gets the ball and he just runs at you. Uh, this is a player to look out for. Uh, I don't know if he'll start for Brentford, but he uh, he's signed for Brentford this week. Uh, four for the tie. As I said, Southampton 4.5. I'm going to go to Neil for first on this one. Brentford against Southampton. Your thoughts, please. Southampton haven't beaten Brentford away since 2011. Adam Milano was one of three scorers that day. Brentford will be a threat from set pieces. I think that will be the difference in this game. And I've got the biggest left back in the Premier League to score the only goal. It's not Dan Byrne, it's Ayer. I think Ayer is bigger than Dan Byrne. He is massive. So uh, Brentford to win this one with a set piece 1 0. I was often told the fact that Dan Byrne was uh, the tallest defender, in fact, the tallest player in the entire Premier League. But of course, I know that uh, Forrest have signed a goalkeeper who's six foot eight. What was your score prediction again, Neil? I've got 1-0 for Brentford to win. 1-0 to Brentford, yeah. Brentford have won the last three games against Southampton in the Premier League and haven't 
conceded a goal at 2 3 nils up to Brentford in a 2 0 last time out at Southampton. Uh, so, 1 0 for Brentford. They'll be happy with that. 1.74 uh, for Brentford to win. Your score prediction on this one, please, Paul. Yes, they gave a good account of themselves last week at Anfield. Um, defensively, yeah, they got picked apart. You're not going to go to Anfield and have a lot of possession. And they didn't, but they showed things. There's things in that game that Thomas Frank would have taken positives out of. They're very, very good at set plays, very organised. Like Mel says, there's every chance they're going to get a goal from set plays. Southampton, I still think the new signings are settling in. I think there's still a, a bedding in period for them. Difficult place to go, Brentford. 2-0 to the Bees. Uh, another uh, victory for Brentford by keeping a clean sheet. If you are going for Brentford to win 2-0, uh, the last three games between these two sides, Brentford have won the first half and the second half in all three of them. So they have got a good record for scoring in both halves against Brentford, uh, against Southampton and Brentford. So if you are backing 2-0 for Brentford, maybe Brentford scoring both halves and win both halves is also something worth looking at. Now... We're going to Everton against Bournemouth. Let's talk about Everton. 2.76 for Everton. Bournemouth are 2.56. They are the favourites slightly to win at Goodison Park. 3.4 for the tie. Your quick thoughts on this one, Paul, and a score prediction, please. I, I just think at some point it's, it's got to click for Everton. I just You look at the team, you look at the players that they've got in there, you just you wonder, don't you? I mean, Sean Dyche, this is his area this is what he does he gets the best performances out of uh, lesser squads if you like a smaller budget I've just been really surprised at how they've started the season and how porous they've been how many goals they've conceded because that's not a Sean Dyche team the amount of goals that this Everton team have conceded you, 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 you worry about them the forward line Harrison, Decore, McNeil, Calvert-Lewin is Calvert-Lewin going to be there when the window closes there's going to be a lot of questions around players you know where they're going to be by, by the end of this week Bournemouth for Nielsen, I'd like to see what Mel's thinks of him. He looks a decent player to me. Looks a really good player, the striker that they brought in to replace Solanke. I just think at Everton, they've got to get it right. I don't think this is going to be pretty. I think Everton are going to try and shut up shop. If they concede early, it could be difficult for them. I'm going to go for a 1-1 stalemate. I think it could be an edgy, edgy game at Goodison. Uh, which is interesting because the draw is the last result you get between these two sides, really. They haven't drawn since 2-2 at Bournemouth all the way back in 2018. I think it's a good, what, seven or eight games since then and there's been a victor every single time. I think what's disappointing for Everton, the Brighton game at home, you can go, look, it was just one of those games. We had our chances. You have a bad day at the office. It just hurts more that it's a bad day at the office on the first day at the office, the first game of the season. But they went to Spurs and just, it was almost like a white flag. But I do remember when Everton got battered 6-0 at Chelsea last year and they were awful. And then Chelsea, uh, Everton's response to that was a, a magnificent run of games, great form, almost like, right, that's rock bottom. We start now. I wonder if that's how Everton are going to respond against Bournemouth because the pressure's on here for the home side. Um... Your uh, score prediction on this one, please, Neil. Yeah, I don't think Neil Malpay will play uh, after his reaction on the train, the video. We've all seen it. Um, Bournemouth have drawn the first two Premier League games 1-1. I don't think they'll get anything from it. I think there will be a response from Everton. They made six changes when they beat Doncaster in the Cup. So they've had a bad week, Bournemouth. Bad luck in terms of the VAR call against Newcastle. I thought that was wrong, VAR. Bad call in the Cup as well against West Ham. No VAR. They needed it because the goal shouldn't have stood. But I think Everton will, will get their most popular scoreline in recent years. In fact, the last last year's most popular winning scoreline at home was, was 2-0 and 1-0. I'm going to go for one of them. 1-0. Oh, I put, I put two there. I just, just, I just preempted you and put two down. And you're going for one. Let me write that down again. I will tell you, by the way, Bournemouth have failed to score in the last two games at Goodison Park. They've lost 3-0 last season and 1-0 the season before. And Decore is the guy. I love Decore. I think when he's on his game for Everton, I think he's a wonderful midfielder. Uh, he has scored two in his last two at home to Bournemouth for Everton. So if you fancy Everton to score, he may be someone worth looking at. Now we come to the... Well, welcome to the Premier League Ipswich Town. Your season starts now. Forget the game at home to Liverpool. Forget the game away at Manchester City. Your season starts now. Just dumped out the League Cup by Wimbledon. So not the best preparation. Uh, 3.05 for Ipswich. Fulham at 2.32. 3.55 for the tie. I'm going to put this down as one of the toughest games to call this weekend. It would be for me personally. Uh, you have got first picks on this one, Neil. Your score prediction from Portman Road, please. Yeah, I think it's rich. They played a lot of the new signings in that game against Wimbledon and were surprised, we have to say that, to be knocked out to a League Two team in the League Cup. 
Uh, it will take them time to bed these new signings in. They've made some good signings. I think they've got a little bit of pace going forward, which will be a counter-attack uh, threat against the likes of Fulham. Big game for them. I think a point would be a good result. I just think Fulham are better. I just think Fulham are better. They had a decent result last weekend against Leicester. I look at Fulham and think they'll have just enough to go there and get the result. I think both teams will score. And maybe Muniz, he hasn't scored yet this season. He finished with nine in his last 16 last season. Muniz for me to score and Fulham to get an away win. I've got 2-1 for Fulham. This is one of those games I always think when you're... um... Uh, a, a championship side coming up into the Premier League. This is a game where you realise how difficult the Premier League is. Because Fulham, with the greatest respect to Fulham, they could just be on the cusp of the top half. They might be 15th, 16th. You just don't know with Fulham. But when you see that lineup as an Ipswich Town fan and you see that the quality that Fulham have, you go, they could really hurt us. They could really hurt us. And you just think, this is Fulham we're talking about who could finish anywhere from 9th to 17th. We just don't know. And they could do some real damage. Fulham, by the way, have got a great record against Ipswich. Uh, they haven't played all too recently, but the last six games, Fulham have won the lot against Ipswich. Some League Cup and some in the Championship. Uh, your score prediction, please, Ipswich against Fulham, Paul. Yeah, you're right. This is where the Premier League starts for, for Ipswich, isn't it? I mean, Liverpool at home, first game of the season, then Man City away. You are, they're not season-defining games for them. You almost write them off, but you want you, you to, to come out with a performance. Um, the Liverpool at home game, I think they did. City away, they, they got what you expected. This is a game that they've got to win. I think they've got to start picking up points. They've got to pick up points at home. But like you say, Fulham are just a very good, experienced Premier League team. Fulham went to Old Trafford first game of the season, didn't they? They only lost 1-0. Arguably sh shouldn't have lost. Then they beat Leicester. They're just a good, well-organised team. But Ipswich have got to find something from somewhere. They've got to make it difficult. They've got to find a goal. I'm going to chuck this one in for the upset of the weekend. Ipswich 2, Fulham 0. Ah, two. Oh, keeping a clean sheet as well. Uh, let's have a look at the price on that one, because Ipswich are 3.05, which is tempting. Some people may argue they probably want a little bit uh, bigger, but if you go for 2-0 to, uh, to the home side, 14. I thought that would be fairly big, so that's a 14 price. Next up for Ipswich after this one is a trip away to Brighton, then they're away to Southampton. So some real crunch games uh, for Ipswich coming up. So it is uh, an away win. Again, disagreement. I like this. Away win for um for Neil, uh, for Neil in this one and Paul has gone for a home win for Ipswich. Then it's Leicester against Aston Villa, a Midlands derby. 4.5 for Leicester City, Aston Villa a 1.76. The tie has just greyed out on my console. Everything is padlocked. It'll be coming back in a second if you fancy a tie between these two sides. Right, uh, it was Neil who went first last time. Paul, you're thinking between Leicester and Aston Villa and your score prediction, please. I uh, saw Leicester get completely outplayed by Tottenham um, at home and defensively they, they were all over the place in the first half. They, they got the goal in the second half, battled their way to stay in the game. I've got it down as a tough season for Leicester. Um, I think Villa, we know Villa are a good side. They played really well against Arsenal last week without getting the opportunities to, well, without taking their opportunities, sorry. I think that Villa go there and with the pace that Villa have got in the attacking areas, I think Villa win this. I think Villa go there and they win it comfortably. I think they go there and win 3-1. 3-1 uh, for uh, Aston Villa, says Paul. The tie, by the way, is 3.9. It has come back. This is where Leicester realise how improved their local rivals are because they would have tipped up Aston Villa as a side. Yeah, we could take some points off them. They're Aston Villa. They'll also be, you know, like the Fulham that we mentioned before. But this is a brand new Aston Villa side with brand new ambitions and could finish, you know, anywhere from, uh, you know, probably fourth to anywhere to, to seventh or eighth, something like that. Uh, the, the quality they have, uh, it could be a tough day at the office for Leicester. What was your scoreline again? You went for? 3-1 to Villa. Big result for Aston Villa. Uh, the last time they played it, they won by 2-1. Ollie Watkins uh, was uh, the opening goal scorer for Villa that day. You're thinking here then, uh, Neil, scoreline between Leicester and Aston Villa. Similar. Yeah, similar. I know Leicester uh, got a point first game. Narrowly beaten at Fulham, but uh, I think there's a heavy defeat coming the way and this could be the one. I think Villa will want to respond, having lost against Arsenal. And I thought they looked good. I thought they looked good going forward. Missed chances. I don't think they'll miss them same chances away at Leicester. Morgan Rogers really liked him. I think he's going to have a big season for Aston Villa. Hasn't scored this season. He's got three in an Aston Villa shirt. Has never scored away for Aston Villa. I think he'll get his first away goal in a Villa shirt. I've got 4-1 for Villa to win away at Leicester. 
Morgan Rogers has looked sensational so far this season. He's looked, he's looked like a brand new player. He looks amazing. Uh, just another stat for you. I mentioned that Ollie Watkins scored the first goal last time when Aston Villa played at Leicester. He also scored the first goal uh, when uh, Aston Villa uh, played last at home to Leicester, where Leicester won 4-2, if you remember, uh, at uh, Villa Park back in early 2023. So Ollie Watkins has uh, uh, scored the first goal in the last two meetings between these two sides and has to make amends for that shocking miss against Arsenal in the first half at Villa Park as well. You've gone for 4-1 for Aston Villa. Let me get the price up on that one because that will be really big. Correct score, 4-1 Aston Villa. 26. A 26 for Neil Meller. Let's keep a track on this one then. Uh, next up is Nottingham Forest against Wolves. Forest, who have actually, I think, started okay so far this season. They uh, they would have been even better had they just hung on at home to Bournemouth. And uh, Wolves, where we don't really know where Wolves are so far this season. 2.1 for Forest. Uh, Wolves are 3.4. Again, a bit of a Midlands rivalry. 3.6 for the tie. Uh, Neil, your score prediction for Forest against Wolves, please. The uh, Nuno... The Nuno Derby, we'll call it. Yeah, uh, they started well. Forest, four points out of six. I think they'll be delighted with that. Wolves, the only team in the Premier League not to start an Englishman. So they've had a little bit of stick about that this week. Um, I think Forest, I've got goals more than Wolves. I know Wolves are trying to do a little bit of business, aren't they, in terms of bringing players in in the final third. But yeah, heavy defeat last weekend against Chelsea. They want to respond. I think this will be close. I think I'm sort of torn between will it be a draw or will Forest nick it? I don't see Wolves going there and winning. I'm just going to shade towards Forest winning this one. I've got a 2-1 home win for Forest. Uh, yeah, I could tell you that uh, Wolves have failed to score in their last two away games. So uh, their last two, their last three away games, though, you look at Wolves and think, oh, God, their away form is pretty dismal. Yeah, their last three away games were Man City, Liverpool and Arsenal. They've had a right run of away fixtures towards the end of last season and the start of this season. It has been a fairly solid start for Nottingham Forest and they will be thoroughly delighted to get a win here that puts them on seven points after nine, after three games. Uh, you're thinking here, therefore, uh, Paul, Forest against Wolves, please. And they get the seven points. 2-0 to Forest. I worry for Wolves. I think they've lost two really key players in Neto and Kilman, especially Kilman. Not so sure that they've replaced well enough. We know that their budget's not great. So, obviously, the Chelsea result last week, which we're going to talk about in the Chelsea game, the uh, preview next. Chelsea, they created so many chances. They're tall Wolves apart. Going to a place like Forest, who are playing, they're playing okay at the moment, Forest. I've got Forest to win this 2-0. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, you said a no Englishman starting for Wolves. That may change as uh, I think Sam Johnston is set to sign. If he's not already done so, the goalkeeper from Crystal Palace for 10 million. Also, Wolves have close to a deal for Brazilian midfielder Andre as well. The last four meetings between these two sides have all been draws. 1-1 in the League Cup, 1-1 in the Premier League, 1-1 in the Premier League, and then 2-2 in the Premier League. Matthias, uh, Matthias Cunha, who uh, had bagged, in, uh, bagged at the weekend. He's also got two in two against Forrest. Um, so, the tie, if you fancy that, bear in mind the last four games have all finished all square. Uh, that is, he says, looking for it, Nottingham Forest. Where are Nottingham Forest? I think they've disappeared off my console. Uh, but the tie is a play between Nottingham Forest and Wolves. Right, let's move on to Chelsea against Crystal Palace. Interesting are uh, Chelsea because we still don't really know what we're going to get between these two sides. Chelsea are 1.61. Chelsea did okay against Man City. Absolutely then walloped Wolves. There might be more people going, I think Chelsea might actually do something this season, as Neil Mellor predicted in the Premier League uh, a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, the price is in this one. 1.61 for Chelsea. Crystal Palace of 5.1. 4.4 for the tie. It is Paul's first picks on this one from Stamford Bridge. Chelsea, Crystal Palace. Score prediction, please. Uh, listen, Chelsea surprised a lot of people last week, and I think we're going to be talking a lot about Chelsea this season, aren't we? We talk about the players, we talk about the amount of the signings that they've got, the squad, the squad size they've got. And then we saw Enzo Maresca's comments yesterday about Raheem Sterling, about the players that he's that are surplus to requirements. Obviously, that's going to stop when the window closes, but they're the first club that we're going to be talking about when the uh, window closes and what's going to happen in January as to who's going to leave. I think the, the overhaul of players there is just going to continue. But listen, they were impressive at Wolves last week. You can't take that away from the creative chances. Chelsea fans were happy with the way that they played last week. Cole Palmer, for me, he looks on a different level again. And it's very, very hard to, to tip Crystal Palace up going to, to Stamford Bridge. Whether we see a Crystal Palace that has Eddie and Ketia in time, whether they even get a swap deal with Raheem Sterling done in time, still don't think Palace have got enough to go there. Chelsea are full of goals, but they do leak goals. 
I'm going to go 3-1 Chelsea. 3-1 Chelsea. I've got a question for you shortly. Uh, 3-1 for Chelsea. Uh, Neil, you're quite a fan of Chelsea. As I said, when we predicted what the Premier League uh, would look like uh, at the end of this one, you did tip them to finish quite high up. So you must have been overjoyed to see them absolutely demolish Wolves. Uh, what's your score prediction, please, for Chelsea against Crystal Palace? I'm going to have to correct you. I am not a fan of Chelsea. I never have been and not. So uh, I will not be cheering any victory for Chelsea this season. Um, but I do think they'll go well. I do think they'll go well. Uh, and it, it didn't surprise me, that result. No way did that surprise me. I think Chelsea are top four. I, I think I think they'll surprise people because they've got so many players. There. I was like, oh, it can't work. I think it will work. Uh, and I think they'll get some good results this season. Don't see them having a problem against Palace. What I would say about Palace, they've lost the, the first two games. They've been a bit unlucky because they should have scored the first goal in both games. One bizarrely disallowed against Brentford for that free kick essay. And against West Ham, they had some good chances. They had three or four good chances. Didn't take it at nil-nil. And then West Ham went bang-bang, made a few subs, uh, and that made a difference for West Ham. So um, I think Palace will be OK, but this is a tough game. I've got Chelsea to win 2-1. Palmer will be involved in some way to score or assist. Yeah, absolutely. I just must reiterate, you're a fan of Chelsea to do quite well this season in terms of finishing yeah. quite high up. It's interesting that Paul went for 3-1 because the last time Chelsea played Crystal Palace, they won 3-1. That was at Sellers Park. And it's interesting that you went for 2-1 because the last time they played at Stamford Bridge, Chelsea won by two goals to one. Question for you. How many games consecutively is it that Chelsea have beaten Crystal Palace. So how how long is that run expended, uh, uh, extended? How many games do you think it is consecutively that Chelsea have beaten Crystal Palace in the Premier League? Just give me a number. Paul? Ten. I, I, I think it's 14. It's 13 in the Premier League and one in the Cup. So I'll go 14 wins in a row. This will be win number 15 if Chelsea do win this one. So 14 consecutive victories for Chelsea against Crystal Palace, which I've got to be honest, is a stat I didn't realise until I looked at it and went, wow, that's quite a record. So Crystal Palace were going, oh, it's them again, is it? Uh, so Chelsea against Crystal Palace, uh, which is another 130 kickoff. Uh, and uh, Chelsea, as I said, could be 15 uh, runs uh, wins consecutively uh, for the home side, and that is our preview of match day three. Treble, we, treble, treble. I'm going to come, I'm gonna come to the trebles very, very, very soon. In fact, I'll come to the trebles right now. Uh, right, so you did well. You both did well last uh, last week. Let's go for the treble for Neil. Go on, then your selections, please. Yeah, I've gone for three bankers this weekend. I've got uh, Arsenal. I, I sort of met up my big banker, Aston Villa. Away at Leicester. I put that one in there. What was that? 1.78, something like that. 1.76, yep. Yeah, I knew the one Liverpool. I know they're all under even money, but there you go. Three games there as my... Liverpool's the risky one. I know it's the risky one, but I fancy Liverpool strongly. So that is my treble. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that will be... Let me see if I can work out a price on that one. That will be... It says a 4.55, which is about right on that one because you've chosen three favourites. Again, as you did with Chelsea last week, I thought that was risky. I do think Liverpool will risk it 1.9 because I think Man United might get something from that game. So uh, you've gone for Liverpool, uh, you've gone for Villa and you've gone for Arsenal. Your treble, please, Paul, for match day three. Well, like I said last week, I'll get you some more free money. Last week's treble was there and it was quite obvious to see. This week's the same. Three teams playing in London. Arsenal, Manchester City and Chelsea. All yeah. to win. Uh, and that, by the way, is a, a treble of a round three. So uh, Chelsea... Uh, Man City and Arsenal. Uh, so thank you, guys. That was uh, uh, pleasant as always. Uh, good to look at match day three. Remember, whatever your bets are, always please do gamble responsibly. We're we're away. We're we're on an international break as well. So uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks for match day four. Until then, be gamble aware. <laughs>